welcome to another newscast. My name is Sam Healy, and in this video, we're going to show you all of the latest news about our projects, as well as the company. As always, if you don't want to watch the entire video, you can just skip to the parts that interest you by utilizing the timestamps in the description below. For general news this week, my buddy JT and I will be getting Monster Apocalypse to the table for a recorded playthrough tonight. We played on Sunday and had a blast, so we're looking forward to sharing this recorded play with you soon. Now, we are still waiting for the upgraded components for Darkest Dungeon, though, so as soon as they come in, we'll be getting a playthrough of that done, too. There's, like I said last week, there's a lot of things moving and shaking, so you just have to stay tuned. For Time of Legends, Joan of Arc, and Steam Watchers, we don't have any more updated information on shipping at this point. Our fulfillment manager is at the tail end of a very long move, so bear with us a while longer and we'll get you more updated info as soon as it comes in. Until then, please refer to last week's newscast for where we are on both. This week, we have updates for Darkest Dungeon, the board game, and Six Siege, the board game, so let's get to it. For Solomon Kane today, not much of an update per se. It's more like the pudding, because the proof is in the pudding, as they say. As we like to do, we have some pictures of your pledges ready for shipment in November with Super Fantasy Brawl Round 2, as we shared last week. So, after last week's assembly line video, enjoy this montage. Dungeon the board game, welcome back to the gloomy hamlet, Torchbearers. A perfect spot for this time of year. Before we proceed to our boss spotlight this week, a couple of words about the state of the game. As you know, we're close to production, and external playtests are going on smoothly to give us a bit of final feedback. Just to clarify though, this feedback has nothing to do with the mechanisms and gameplay. 
Rather, they endeavored to catch grammatical mistakes and make sure what we wrote in the rule book makes sense and helps you play well. Yes, we have the final rule book laid out as well, and it needs to be tested along with the rest of the materials. We certainly aren't expecting it, but if anything major comes to light during our external playtesting process, we will keep you posted. Lastly, we don't have a closing date for the Pledge Manager just yet. Several of you have suggested that we always add this to our updates, so you might see this sentence repeated several times. But now, to our new boss spotlight, the Templars. Now that the imminent threats are all dealt with, the way to the darkest dungeon is open. And one, or rather two, of its guardians are the Warlords. These high rank cultists, mutated beyond recognition, guard the room beyond the final encounter, a deadly arena with spiked pits. The Impaler will throw the heroes into those pits, inflicting huge amounts of bleed, while the Warlord keeps its distance, shooting poisonous bolts, inflicting blight. As these Templars work together as a single boss, defeating them both is required to win the fight. Damage over time resistances or immunities will help a lot in the fight. So if your heroes don't have any, make sure to bring along enough bandages and potions. For six Siege today, we wanted to tackle the map packs and address the manner of depth and replay value they bring to the table. During development, we had to make choices to pick only six iconic maps from the video game out of many. To make sure they would be iconic choices, we asked for feedback, stats, and asked Ubisoft and video game aficionados what maps they preferred. We wanted the base game maps to be accessible to all, especially when discovering the game, but we also wanted to add variety, asymmetry, as well as some environments that are more difficult to grasp. The goal being to contribute new ways of playing the game. Concerning replayability, granted, the new maps bring some replay value, but this facet of the game relies more on the destructibility of the environment. Assaults can be taken in so many different approaches, and the environment is able to constantly evolve so that no game will look like another. The two core maps, Consulate and Clubhouse, themselves are already very replayable. The two map pack expansions allow you to pit your operators against each other in four new asymmetric maps. They bring new constraints and prompt you to change the way you play and your team composition. With map pack 1, Concrete City, the first notable change is the map size. Contrary to the other maps, this map pack with Cafe Dostoevsky and Bank is smaller with a board of 60 by 60 centimeters instead of 90 by 60 centimeters. It easily fits smaller tables. Each side begins more up close and personal on these maps, so your operators will be in the thick of things much more quickly. Cafe Dostoevsky is a chic cafe in downtown Moscow. This map is very open and full of obstacles, which favors the attackers. It's a square building with only a few windows, but is easy to access from almost everywhere. Inside, there are numerous destructible walls, so controlling areas can be difficult as access points and lines of sight are numerous. Defending is unstable on this map, so both teams will have to stay on guard and always keep moving. Use your intel tools wisely as well, because a frontal assault will incur losses to both sides. Bank depicts multiple stories of a bank in Los Angeles and is the polar opposite, a cramped, closed space which favors the defenders. It's a very fortified environment and is difficult to assault. In order to reach the mission objective rooms, the attackers only have three avenues through rooms that are easily defended. The defending player can either take a team of tanks with passable mobility or a gadget-heavy team intent on slowing the opponent down. For the attackers, their team should be versatile while retaining the ability of destroying a lot of heavy walls. With Map Pack 2, Dead End, these two maps are very wide both inside and out and are more suited for operators that can use speed or long range to their advantage. 
The buildings themselves are wide, and this prevents players to predict exactly how the assault is going to unfurl. The great distances mean that the teams should be more reactive and the plans more elaborate. Chalet is a luxurious winter house in Courchevel, France. This long building is very open with lots of access points which favor the attackers. It has two big inner spaces and some outer areas. The west and east wings both have objective rooms and they're linked together by an L-shaped corridor. Each wing has numerous rooms and access points. This map is generally difficult to defend, and the defender will need to be reactive to adapt to the opponent's choices. Overall, quick operators are a big plus. Oregon is a survivalist complex set deep in the Oregonian woods. This map is difficult to approach if defended correctly and favors the defenders. It has a long L-shaped building with a smaller annex. The buildings are separated and flanked with outside rooms or areas. So accessing the main building is difficult as the paths leading to it are exposed. The attacker should be patient when approaching the objectives and should first focus on controlling an access point. Depending on the strategy they choose, they can opt on a versatile team but this is a great place to have a team with very focused skill sets. These two map packs are a great answer for going all in. If you have all the environments, you can have an ascending difficulty level across all of them. Consulent and Clubhouse are both balanced and easy to grasp. Café Dostoevsky and Chalet both have very open and involving environments, but they require a bit more experience. Bank and Oregon are the more cramped and closed spaces, so they are intrinsically defended. And they're basically aimed towards more expert players. So if you want to challenge yourself as the attacker, these maps are for you. Now remember that Leo will be live tomorrow at 6 p.m. GMT, 1 p.m. Eastern Time on our YouTube channel with a live Q&A in English and at 8.30 p.m. Paris Time with a live Q&A in French. So Tune in if you have any questions or if you just want to see what you might spoil. It's always a great time hanging out with Leo. My wife and I will be doing another live playthrough on this Thursday in our Mythic Plays series. And I'll be hosting another live Q&A on Friday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. To answer any questions that you may want to ask me about, just throw them at me. I'll see what I can do. But that's it for today, though. Stay safe. Play some games while you're at it. And we'll see you on the flip side. Take care.